Wow, good morning. Ooh, she's hot. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, good morning. Thank you so much for being here as folks uh, continue to join us. Um, I am so honored, so pleased, so excited, so hype about this conversation, about these amazing, phenomenal women on this panel, and also about being here in community with each and every one of you. So we will get started. Um, I am Afton Battle, uh, Vice President of uh, Artistic Operations at Lyric Opera Chicago, as well as founder of BGM Consulting. And I have the distinct pleasure to share the stage with three phenomenal women. These women are executive leaders in our industry who are breaking glass ceilings, crushing the field, blasting through and landing on the other side of that glass cliff, and if you couldn't tell already, officially part of my fangirl club. <laughs> uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce to you today Kim Davis, founder and principal of 516 Consulting, Tanisha Nash Laird, president and CEO of the Greater Roxbury Arts and Cultural Center, and Nadej Souvenir, Chief Operating Officer of St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation. Welcome. Okay, so for those of you who are joining us virtually, please don't forget to pop your comments in the Hop In app. Um, go to the Q&A tab of this session and we'll make sure to get to those questions at the end of our time. Um, so I can't do justice introducing you all. So if you wouldn't mind sharing with us who you are a little bit about yourself and what inspires your work. Such a big question. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. So my name is Kim Davis. Uh, I'm currently the founder and principal of 516 Consulting, which was grown out of my life experience in the arts education and arts administration space. Uh, prior to this work, I was a senior director of education at the Old Town School of Folk Music, um, along with a variety of other municipal and nonprofit organizations. Um, I'm also working on my doctorate degree in leadership and innovation, and so my work really uh, centers around mainly this topic today and how it intersects with, uh, with the work of black female uh, leaders in the arts and culture space. So I'm really looking forward to continuing that work as well. Hi everyone, um, I'm Tanisha Nash Laird. I am the founding uh, president and CEO of what will be the Greater Roxbury Arts and Cultural Center. I'm about six weeks in to the job and I'm developing uh, that new performing arts center in the Roxbury section of Boston. Um, I previously ran the Newark Symphony Hall in Newark, New Jersey, uh, which is nearly 100 year old concert hall. Um, it had fallen in disrepair uh, and uh, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today was really based on the work that I did there to turn the institution around, build the capacity of its predominantly BIPOC staff, uh, and um, what drives me? You know, I, before I moved into running uh, arts organizations, I was the head of economic development for the city of Trenton, New Jersey. And really, I look at everything that I do through uh, the lens of cultural equity and uh, economic opportunity. And so I'm excited to be able to not only be put in a position to provide that, uh, but to talk to you about that work today. Um, and I'm so excited, I have to just fan out a little bit. You know, my kids, I have two kids, they're 12 and 16, and uh, they play cello and violin, and they dream of being at Sphinx, particularly the competition one day, and I've now made it without playing a single string instrument. <laughs> and so I'm pretty excited about that, so thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Nadej Souvenir. Um, you know what, let's go back a little bit. I am an artist from a long time ago, a dancer. Um, then I transitioned into arts administration for a little bit. Uh, then I became a corporate litigator because that's natural. Um, <laughs> and after doing that for some time, I transitioned to philanthropy where now I'm the chief operating officer of Minnesota's largest community foundation. Um, and in addition to that, and probably one of the reasons I'm here, um, I'm also very active in my volunteer life um, with nonprofit performing arts organizations. I'm currently the chair of the Minnesota Opera Board and also sit on the board of Opera America. So can you see why I just like fangirl over all of them? Um, thank you all so much. 
Um, so we only have 54 minutes, so we're just going to dive right in. Um, the topic of our discussion today is pay equity. Show me the money, right? Uh, we are talking about an honest conversation about pay equity for women and those of us who identify as a person of the global majority. The first topic I want to dive into is women in leadership and what it means in the discussion of pay equity. The days of discussing pay are over. So is the misconception of the HR space. However, the pay gap between male and female executives in US companies expanded during the pandemic, even after years of improvement. This is according to a new analysis by a financial re research firm, Morningstar. So my first question is, as a woman entering into an executive role, how do we successfully negotiate and achieve our fair, <laughs> our fair and equitable pay? And how do we do that in comparison to our male counterparts? I can repeat that question because I just like fudged all over myself there. I don't know who wants to start. I, I will it. say um, two jobs ago, that was something that I was very intent. I was gonna be seceding um, a white male. Uh, I knew his salary um, when, uh, cause obviously, you know, anybody can find out salaries of nonprofits. Um, and the original offer was significantly less than what he made. And so I countered, and when I countered, I also talked about how I intended to uh, fulfill their strategic plan, all the places that they had failed, and, and, you know, and I did alignment. So that was a good thing I did. What was a bad thing I did was that the last job that I took, the job after that, I took a 25% pay cut. And I did nobody a favor in doing that. Um, and I did it because I said, oh, I'm going to uh, an under-resourced black, significantly, you know, black-led organization that had been in uh, annual deficits. Um, and it took years for me to move myself back to a place where I should have been. Now, because I was the CEO, I was able to move the staff, but I didn't move myself. And I remember when I was negotiating with the board, there was a board member who said, you should not have actually accepted a lower salary because now some people are having problems, even though, by the way, I had raised at that point $10 million um, in less than two years. It turned around. The uh, deficits that had been plaguing the organization had increased our earned revenue had obviously significantly increased philanthropy, but she said, you know, moving you to an equitable salary, because that's really what it was, oh, there's some board members who have problems with that. So I say go and do from the outset, I should have done with that black organization what I did with that predominantly white institution. Uh, I should have gone in with the same um, fervor, intentionality, uh, and again, that was a mistake that I made, and I did nobody a favor by doing that. Starting with myself, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to add to that because, well, first of all, I, I use the phrase buckle up, um, mainly because sometimes things come, down, come out of my mouth that are so truthful that some folks can't, can't handle it, so buckle up. Uh, but to, to add to that, I just want to say that I don't think it does anyone a service to be comparing salaries from one organization to another. Just because one organization paid you less does not mean that you are not um, qualified to receive an equitable salary at your upcoming organization. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's having a conversation with you about that as you're moving to a new organization, we need to strike that conversation, right? right? We, we shouldn't be comparing organizations in that manner. So um, sorry that happened to you, but. Oh, well, no, I did it to myself, right? So, but, but again, right. you shouldn't have, have had to fight for a salary that was already there. Mm -hmm. If they had the money to pay the person before you, right, right. they have the money to pay you. Well, to be clear, the person that at the last job before me, he made $10,000 more, but not significantly more. I should have gone in knowing the value that I was bringing to the organization, knowing the plan that I had to turn it around very quickly, which I did in the first yeah. year. That should have been the time we had that conversation. It shouldn't mm -hmm. have taken three and a half years for me to get a pay increase. True, right. very true. Mm -hmm. 
Right, and I think one of the things that's really important is understanding your worth. So the reality is if you get a low ball offer, which you probably will, because everyone's gonna try to you know, save the budget in a leadership transition at key roles, um, and you counter it, and they're not into that, or they reject it, or they sort of hem and haw, you are learning a lot about that organization, and you have a moment to decide whether or not it's important enough to you to take that job at that moment to deal with the beginning of a series of petty nonsense that you're gonna yes. put up with. Like, let, let me just be really honest. I mean, if they're doing that from the jump, they're gonna do it all the way across the board and they're gonna nickel and dime you at, like, not just for your dollars, but for your time, for your effort, for your energy, all of it. Yes, I should look at that. Yeah, but the research the piece, research I is, think, is, is very uh, crit critical. Right. When you're People doing know like searches. nonprofits, like you know you can find like executive compensation on 990s, right? Mm -hmm. Because I like I'm often talking to people and they have no idea about that. And so at the very least, if you're at a certain level in an organization, figure out what the person before you was making, because you should at least ask for that, because 990s are always a year back. Mm -hmm. So at the time they left, they're actually making more. So if what you're asking for is what you can see, like that's still there's still room, usually. And I, was, oh, sorry. Yep. I would say also use your network. Yes. You know, there are colleagues across the field that have been in these positions. Talk right. to them about where you're moving to. See if they know somebody that's been at that organization before. But really use your network and do your research before taking the, uh, a job offer. Absolutely. And this beautifully dovetails into my next question, which is the new salary transparency laws that have been rolling out <laughs> across the U.S. Um, as we know, starting January 1st, uh, many states have um, been required to, excuse me, as we know, starting on January 1st, three states, California, Rhode Island, and Washington, have joined a chorus of other states and cities who are now enacting a salary transparency law. This is in place to intend to give workers more leverage to negotiate their earnings and to close the wage gap. My next question starts with you, Kim. As a consultant in the field with years of experience in executive recruiting, what challenges or successes have you seen with this new law? This is such a loaded question. Um, so the, the point of the wage laws were to, as you said, close the uh, wage gaps that, that are rampant across almost every industry. The problem with the laws is that there are ways to skirt around it. So what you'll see now is that companies will list massive pay ranges. So there's no reason, I think we talked about this in our, in our prep call, there's no reason for a salary range to be listed at 40,000 to 240,000. That's, that's just a way that's not for them to get around right. the, the pay transparency, right? So again, going back to doing your research about those organizations, doing your research about who's been in those positions before, is very critical to, to the uh, job search that you're, that you're doing. Um, the other thing that I've been noticing um, is that while you have this tra uh, pay transparency, it's not that they are being transparent across the entire organization. What they need to be doing, and we also talked about this, is really talking about the entirety of the scale of all of the workers in the organization. So how does this salary for this job compare to the other positions in the organization? That information is also very critical. It makes no sense for them to be bringing this position to an equitable pay range and leaving all of the other staff in a very unequitable situation. So we need to be talking about that as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get ahead of the conversation, but that, that is something that I actually had to actively work on moving, and again, I moved all of them before, before myself, but actively moving people to equitable pay throughout the organization. And I know this is anticipating a future question, but I'm just gonna say it now. Um, that also included being very direct and transparent with donors, saying, you know, we are going to be moving to equitable pay, not only for the administrative staff, by the way, but that also included the artists, you know? So there was a lot of work that we did, and we were very intentional, and we didn't move, and there were some donors um, who were absolutely understood. Um, and actually, what was interesting, it was my board. Uh, and again, I was running a predominantly uh, BIPOC institution, including the, the board. Uh, but they have been in such a mindset that we can't possibly pay people. 
I have to tell you one story that I literally cried. Um, my mom died making minimum wage. Um, she died 16 years ago. She made minimum wage her entire life. When we were looking, when I had successfully moved the administrative staff, I was also looking to move ticket takers, you know, the per diem folks, to $15 an hour. And what was so interesting, I presented to the uh, personnel committee of the board, which, again, I wasn't asking permission because it was within budget, so I didn't think I needed to ask for permission. I was just talking about, here are the new uh, management roles, and I thought I was going to get a, a lot of pushback on the expansion of the management role. It was the $15 an hour. They could not understand how we could pay ticket takers $15 an hour. And I cried when I got home, and I, I couldn't understand. And I went back to, a, and by the way, I just did it, right, because it was within budget, right? I went back to a board member, and I said, what was all that? And he said, Tanisha, you have raised a lot of money. We're actually just not used to having money. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that we're going to be paying $15 an hour, and I said, but by the way, they're paid by the operation, right? Like, it's not just that we're, and only when they work. We don't have ticket takers sitting around and uh, front of house staff just sitting around when there's no <laughs> event collecting $15 an hour. They're only paid when they're actual. So I had to educate them on that as well. So I think the education to both your donors um, and if you're in a leadership role to your board to understand how important it is and again, I was in a predominantly black and brown community, mm -hmm. and my board, I still had to fight over that issue of pay equity. I can talk more about how I did it for the rest of the staff. I included hiring a consultant um, mm -hmm. to look at the field. Um, but it was actually all triggered by an email that I received from a colleague who was looking for a new staff member. And it was a very junior, entry-level position. And I noticed that her position paid $10,000 more than my entry level position. And, I, and it also had uh, a contribution to the uh, retirement plan. So mm -hmm. I called her and I said, can we talk about like, how your, composition is, uh, your compensation is structured, even for your most junior people? And that's what I was able, that's when I went on this journey to make sure that even at the entry level, coming right out of school, that they're not making Again, we're in the New York uh, metropolitan market, so I know some places this might not be so low, but people should not have been making $30,000 coming right out in the New York metro area. Um, so that's, that's my contribution to this. Nadege? I mean, I can um, expand on this a lot. You know, like the, the pay transparency has to go with the equity in, in a significant way. And, you know, I work at a foundation, and foundations for years have been sort of espousing, you know, racial equity, equity all over the place. But the reality is on the back side of the door, it didn't look so great. Um, and so, you know, when I um, was in a position of leadership over our HR team, I partnered with our head of HR, and we got really intentional about what it looks like to do this work. And so in 2019, started posting hiring ranges, and we call them that intentionally, and I'm gonna distinguish from like a salary range, because the reality is a number of things factor into how much you can pay someone. One, like what is the job worth? Two, what is your org budget size? And three, like how much money do you have? And also like who are you looking for? Are you looking for an entry level person? Are you looking for somebody who's done that job for 10 years? And so we post ranges that are you know, give or take, um, you know, $3,000 is, is the gap of this range. So nobody's going to be blindsided. You know what you can possibly make. Um, and it also leaves room for negotiation possibilities. But in addition to that, we have um, created pay grades for all of the jobs at our foundation. Everybody knows what grade they're in. Um, routinely, we do um, equity audits to look at people in like jobs and like pay grades to make sure that there are not distinctions across race, across gender, looking at tenure, looking at a number of things. And periodically, we go to our board and we say, hey, we need some more money because we have to do some market adjustments because we got some people out of scope and we have to fix them. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, that work. Like, it takes a ton of time, right? Like, our HR team, every couple of years, is sort of regrading jobs and, and you know, checking out the market and looking what um, peers and comparators are doing. And it's also, um, it also means that some people don't apply for the job because they're like, oh wait, I can't negotiate the secret high salary that maybe I could have negotiated you know, a few years ago. White men, sorry. Um, and <laughs> <coughs> sorry, 
about that. Um, but you know, it, it's super helpful because it's really clear sort of on the front and the back. Um, that being said, there's still work to do because like once you're in, like that's super clear at that point. Once you're in, there's still what annual merit increases, internal promotions and what that looks like. And so you still have to be really intentional um, for yourself, advocating for yourself in the work, but organizations have to continue to be intentional beyond that initial entry point of that first comp. I want to ask a follow-up question in this field here. Um, to you, Tanisha, starting with being the founding president and CEO of um, this new cultural center, taking what you've experienced and this discussion here, how are you going to implement that and start that within your staff now, right? And building it up as you grow the institution and how is your board currently feeling about this? So this is an amazing opportunity. I get to build my board. I get to build the building. So right now, just understand, I'm so far away from that. I'm, I just started uh, conceptual design with the architect. Um, I have one very generous uh, donor, seven-figure donor. I'm hoping to build on that. Um, but I'm, I'm taking notes from Nadej, Nadej, right? Like in terms of the things that I have to think about uh, going forward uh, because I have a, a unique opportunity to start right, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but I do have pay ranges in our plan. Obviously, as I'm going for more funding, I'm showing that. But again, you know, what's, what's great is that there are already institutions, um, institutional donors that are thinking this way, sophisticated uh, philanthropists that are thinking this way. Uh, I know when I was growing, just again to explain, I was growing Newark Symphony Hall as well. I remember um, I was working with a, a prospective donor. I knew I was gonna get the gift, but we were working on it. And they actually said to me, you know, the pay range we think is low, right? <laughs> right. And I said, well, actually I, I make that right now, that they propose. And I said, so we need to figure out how to, to move that. Um, I, I think from a nonprofit organization, that's where the work is, is to make sure that I continue to communicate and almost over communicate that that's part of our core value. Mm -hmm. You know, our core value is about equitable compensation. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we are, you know, the uh, Greater Roxbury Arts and Cultural Center is designed to be uh, black focus institution, so. What an amazing opportunity mm -hmm. that does not come around very often. I know, That's I know. fantastic. I made my for, first board member uh, proposal recently and I think she's coming on. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> um, I also have another follow-up question to Nadej because as a fundraiser, I know uh, philanthropy can be and is most often very, very white. Um, and so from your perspective and your point of view sitting on the inside of philanthropy as a funding agent, <clears throat> excuse me, what are some uh, differences that you see, right, as your funding agent versus the nonprofits that you might work with and have relationships with when it comes to how they are dealing with this pay equity? Are you all diving into these conversations with them as philanthropists? That's really interesting. So we're not necessarily diving into it in, in an intentional way, you know, but you know, observing the, the work that we've all been doing for the last few years, particularly since 2020, what I've seen in nonprofit organizations is they are where they can't exercise um, increased financial reward because you know, the reality of budgets or fundraising, they are exercising other compensation such as more time or um, quiet days so that people you know, aren't in meetings all the time. You know, like finding other ways to give people, um, to give people a total compensation package. Like what we like to say, our head of HR likes to say, it's total rewards. The compensation is one piece. If you get paid a lot of money but you're required to work 24, 7, 365, what's the point? Like what, what are you doing with that money? Because you'll, you'll never have time to spend it or have the space. And so what I'm seeing is where people can't quite get to better compensation, they are being really intentional about shutting the office down on Friday mm -hmm. afternoon. And that seems small, but it's not, because that gives you a little life space mm -hmm. back. It's, it's all of those things. Um, but we're still seeing challenges. I mean, the, the reality is, even though there are these, you know, pay transparency laws, and in Minnesota there are calls, you know, if you, put, if you post something, I think, on our 
Council of Nonprofits and Council of Foundations, you're required to post the transparency range. Again, that doesn't cover any everything, and it doesn't um, it doesn't change sort of the internal practices of the organization. And one of the other things I want to recognize is that's just for employees. So right, we're we're sitting in a space in an industry where people are coming in as contractors, as you know, artists who are here for for gig work. And one of the things that has been really important in in my leadership at the foundation, and I'd love to see happen in other spaces, is. When somebody comes at me with a contract and they, they give me their rates, if I know those rates are too low, I actually pick up the phone and call them and I say, I need you to resubmit this. Mm -hmm. This is not market rate. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not, like, could I, could I save a few budget dollars? Maybe, but the reality is I had enough budget to pay market rates. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna lowball you, particularly, I remember doing this once with um, a, a young uh, black male who was an evaluator and he was like, oh, I'll do it for $25 an hour. And I said, sir, right. your competitors are charging at least $150 an mm -hmm. hour, so I'm going to go ahead and need you to resubmit this proposal so that I can actually pay you what you're worth. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's part of it, too. Like, I want to make sure that we don't just get constrained in the concept of just the salaried employees or the employees in the building. Pay equity should show up in all of the places you pay people for their talent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, as you mentioned, some of the nonprofit organizations, it was a challenging time with COVID. Uh, lots of things happening, especially in the performing arts sector, not being able to perform. Mm -hmm. And so we had to become very creative with the way that we were um, compensating our staff when there were furloughs. And something that I hope that my colleagues in the industry will continue to do is keep those practices alive, right? Not just during a moment when finances are sticky and tough, um, because the work-life balance, especially in the fields that we hold as performing artists, uh, leaders of performing arts organizations, leaders in philanthropy, is all day, every day. And so we have to be able to bake in this time for us and for our staff and employees. Um, which leads to another question very much along these lines. Uh, most of us in this room at some point have been the only woman at the table and many of us have been the only person of color at the table. To the panel, as leaders, let us dive into how we bring along our organization on this journey of true pay equity. How can now nonprofit organizations level set to begin setting these organizational benchmarks against the field, recognizing pay equity and the pay gap historically among women and BIPOC employees? So Tanisha, how do you think that the field can really level set, come in and make true change that sticks in this area? Again, it's about transparency, about being honest, um, about what we are being paid and sharing that information. Um, I know that that was, you know, before we, it was a close held secret, right? What we're making. Um, again, I don't think that does anybody any favors. Uh, I know that I've had experiences of friends finding out that they're doing the same exact job as a white male counterpart making significantly less. So I think um, sharing information and holding people accountable to the fire, especially the, the feet to the fire, especially those who are in positions of power. I'm a, a CEO, executive director, so I'm gonna talk a lot about the board. <laughs> um, there's a lot of board education. Mm -hmm. You said something else that was a little bit of a trigger for me. Um, during the pandemic, I remember being told that I had to furlough people, but I had gotten the uh, 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 PPP. Mm -hmm. And I had to actually do a presentation as to why I was not furloughing people, mm -hmm. right? So it was a really sort of an education thing. And then when we created an initiative that was a grant-funded initiative, and I don't know if the donor is in the room, um, uh, because they came to me, uh, that we hired artists, there was, again, I had gotten a, a call from a board member who was very concerned that I was hiring these 10 artists. And so I had to explain to them, these are artists that are getting stipends, they are not on payroll, this is what we're paying them. So I think there's a lot of, of education mm -hmm. that needs to happen, again, to both boards and donors, um, that these are, you, you know, you can't just talk about right. it, as you said, you know, we have to actually walk 
the talk as well. Yes, and when you talk about board education, have Kim, you, or Ned <laughs> Nadezhda? <Nadege's laughs> I know. <laughs> um, you, can you talk a little bit about you know your experience with that? Because as leaders of nonprofit organizations, we know that the board is the governing body. The board, uh, and we are at the higher fire power of the board, and the board approves our budget, and we run with that and make good of it, and we do the work that needs to be done. Um, so can you talk a little bit about this very delicate um, relationship between <laughs> board and um, leaders of organizations, especially when it comes to finances mm -hmm. and when it comes to making these changes that are crucial and apparent? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, Education is a big piece of this, but one of the things that I like to say, because I sit in this weird intersection where I sit on boards, but I am in an organization where I report, I mean, sort of through my CEO to a board. So I see both ways. Um, and one thing I realize people don't actually know, <laughs> this is very important, is nonprofit is a tax status, right. not a business model. Right, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> like, that's, and it, like that's the biggest rock you have to get over because there's this fundamental misunderstanding that because you're in a nonprofit space is like people should be poor working these jobs. Yeah. Right. That's like no, 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 no. Like I wish we could rename the like tax status category because people get stuck on that. So you've got to get sort of over that piece. And then the other piece you have to get past is I hate that you called it a delicate relationship. That's the reality, it should not be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All of those component parts are part of the whole. No one is more or less important than the other, but often the board is treated like the kings and queen on high and whatever they say goes. But the reality is boards sit in governance, management sits in management. The board approves a budget, maybe some big bucket categories. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes, 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 right? The board approves a budget, maybe some big bucket categories, and to your point, you were within budget. Like, it, it, it would not have been my business mm -hmm. that you were taking people to $15 an hour so long as you were within the, like, containers that the board approved that were consistent with the mission, vision, and our fiduciary responsibilities right. as board members. And I think board members forget that because they start, like, you know, yeah. digging in and, and being like, hey, what's that one expense over there? And how come you didn't get a discount here? And, and you know, I can't believe you're giving this person a raise. And the reality is, you want somebody to come do that at your job? Like, nobody's right. at your corporate office, like, digging into your yeah. budget and, you know, nickel and diming every decision mm -hmm. that, I mean, maybe if you've got a terrible boss. But the reality <laughs> is, it's not happening in the same way. And so I think that, for me, there, there needs to be a place where, um, a way for board members to get educated. And those of us board members who sit at the similar intersection, like we have to be loud. Mm -hmm. Like we have to be loud at the board table because we actually know. We know how it cuts on both sides and we actually have to tell folks about it. Um, and interestingly enough, my foundation is actually thinking about putting together sort of a board training series about this because several of us on our leadership team have seen this mm -hmm. and we want to provide it as a tool and a resource for the nonprofits in in Minnesota. And so hopefully in a year, you know, you'll you'll see a series of videos where we're talking real talk to board members about how they can be better. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do board training as well. I also sit on boards. I didn't mention that. Um, I sit on national boards as well. And I actually think being an ED has made me a better mm -hmm. right board yep. member. Um, you know, I'm I'm now treasurer of a board. Um, and I actually was most recently asked by my cousin in North Carolina to do a training for their get on board for Junior League. I, I think what, what I found is that board members don't always really understand their role, right? Mm -hmm. They hear fiduciary responsibility, but they don't really know what that means, mm -hmm. right? Um, because I see them taking one aspect of that really seriously and not other aspects mm. of that really seriously. Um, and talk to me on the side and I can tell you some of the things <laughs> I've seen. Um, you know, hookups and favor requests and all that. I'm like, yeah. that's part of your, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, education, I know what I've had to do. I've had to always bring in, even though I do board trainings and other capacities for other people, I actually taught this, I was an adjunct at Drexel University. 
but I still brought in consultants, right? Mm -hmm. I brought in third parties. That's why I'm getting your information, uh, Kim. <laughs> uh, for the, even, you know, I might not know. I mean, I think right. I'm building my own thing, but I'm still gonna need uh, yeah. good people. Right. But I think board training, because ultimately board members, sometimes I found that they were just afraid, mm -hmm. right? They just had like real fear. Of, of doing something um, uh, wrong mm -hmm. or doing something that they're gonna be uh, vilified for. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that is back of their head, not real issues, but things that are made up in their head. Yeah, I'd like to add um, to the education component of the board that I that my opinion is that the education piece needs to go throughout the organization. So we're not just educating the board, but we're also educating all of the staff and contractual folks about what the board's responsibility is. Mm -hmm. Because there seems to be a confusion by some folks mm -hmm. internally that if they have a problem with their executive director or their leader, that they can go to the board and the board will solve the problem for them. But that's not the board's responsibility. Mm -hmm. So we need to educate mm -hmm. thoroughly throughout the, uh, throughout the org organization um, I also find it important that there are relationships built. So um, the, the executive director is not the only through line to the right. board at the mm -hmm. same time. Like there needs to be an understanding of the board about who the people are in the organization, what their roles are, how important they are to the uh, organization, that even though they may not be in leadership, they may sit at the front desk, they are just as important mm -hmm. as the person in the administrative office. So. Education throughout the organization is, is vitally important to, to that. Yeah, um, and this, I want to touch on one, one subject here. I don't want time to, to lapse before we do because when we talk about pay equity, we are talking about money. We're mm -hmm. talking about cash money in your bank, but we also need to talk about the pay equity when it comes to the things that we don't pay money for, mm -hmm. when it comes to emotional labor. <laughs> Everybody breathe in yeah. <laughs> and let it go. A trigger. Um, and, and that is uh, a trigger for many of us on this stage, yes. uh, me personally in many, many ways, and many of us in this audience. And we are not paid for this emotional mm -hmm. labor. And so, Kim, when you talk about training across the organization, it brings up training to identify when we are investing emotionally and providing this emotional labor. When we talk about training to the board, it is also training them that this labor, this laborious work that we do, especially in some of our communities where we have been dealing with the uh, social pandemic as well as the you know, health crisis pandemic, um, so how can we as employees, uh, employers, uh, leaders in institutions, board members, be advocates and um, innovators in this way of recognizing the emotional labor that we all go through, and we all go through it, and taking note of it, but also taking stock in our employees to give them the agency to back off and say, I, I'm actually not doing this. Ooh, let me take a breath. <laughs> um, so what I would say is over the last couple of years, I've noted um, multiple organizations putting a lot of pressure on the people of color within the organization to help them move towards an equitable landscape. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of emotional labor mm -hmm. for, your, for your folks to be carrying. Um, asking people of color to recount stories is traumatic. It's violent, and I would suggest that if you were wanting any of that work to happen, you'd most likely hire a consultant, mm -hmm. who you'd most likely pay, right? So if mm -hmm. you're gonna ask your staff to do additional work, we need to be talking about a contractual situation. They're, they need to be paid for their emotional labor. Um, the last organization um, that I was at, we were doing a lot of work in equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, and I don't think I personally realized how much emotional labor I was putting into that along with a, another colleague of mine, um, and it burned me out very quickly. Um, it's one of the reasons why I felt like it was time for me to take a step out of a singular organization and really work with, with the, my colleagues in the field. Um, pay your people, <laughs> is what I would say. And also, don't ask them to recount traumatic and emotional 
situations. We deal with this on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be dealing with it at work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tanisha Nadej? I am, um, you know, it's, it's funny, Nadej says something about the negotiation process giving you cues of what's going to happen. You know, when I think about a, what I would consider a toxic role that I was in, I probably should have figured that out from just the interview process, mm -hmm. right? Um, I joked that, oh, I met, I went through 17 hours of interviews and I met 21 people. And I remember uh, someone who was familiar with the organization said, who do they think they're hiring? You know, the head of the Met, you know. <laughs> that should have been a clue of what I was walking into. Um, and probably should have not walked into. I mean, there's so many, this is beyond the scope of this particular panel, but I, I know why that young man wanted to do the work for $25 an hour, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, I know why I uh, wrongly said, oh, I'm gonna take a 25% pay cut to, to head mm -hmm. this job. Um, thinking it's a black organization, it will not you know, be a similar situation than the one that I was leaving. Um, I think self-care, um, and uh, as a leader, I try to provide the team with that agency um, so that they can be transparent even to me. I think I'm, you know, great. I think I'm a great leader. Um, but I hired an outside consultant to do, facilitate a, a retreat mm -hmm. um, and said, let them tell you, you know, you can tell them anything mm -hmm. and it could be anonymous. So I, that's for my improvement. Um, but there, there, it has to be at that level, though. That the institution has to actually have a commitment to that. And what I would say to you all is if you don't think that institution has a commitment to it, don't go there thinking that you're going to change it. Right. I thought I was going to change things as the executive director, right? That was wrong-headed. Um, it, it has to be, you, you have to do your self-care first. Mm -hmm. Don't walk into situations that are not meant for you. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that the the, whew, the emotional labor piece is is not um, a small thing, especially the last few years. And I know that, you know, in my role at the foundation, I was caring a lot for people because I was leading our you know sort of COVID business you know continuation planning. Then you know George Floyd gets murdered in Minneapolis, and so I was holding all of our black staff as close to my heart as I could. Um, and what I, what I realize is sometimes people will take on the, they aren't asked to, so I agree. Don't be asking people to do that. But you might not ask them and they may do it anyway. Right. You have mm -hmm. to credit that like you would credit if they took on Project X and they knocked it out of the park. Like that is work because what they're doing is helping ensure that the organization is continuing to be successful in other ways. And so you as an organization have to honor that and also as the individual doing the work, y'all honor it too. When you write your self-evaluation, don't just tick off the like, I you know, did such and such project. Also write all of that right. other crap that you did that, no, that is not on your job description that you know damn well that if you hadn't talked to X on that day, they might have quit or if you hadn't done this thing over here, that pop project would have collapsed and give yourself credit mm -hmm. for Absolutely. it. Mm -hmm. Because once, once you give yourself credit for it, if the organization doesn't give you credit, like you will start to understand how you're worth in a different way. Um, and, I, and I say that as a person who did that. I sit in my current role. It, it's a new role for our foundation. Um, and I made the case and actually sort of laid out an entire argument and said, this is the comp I want. That was the end, that was the closing sentence. It wasn't a range, wasn't an offer, it wasn't a negotiation. It was very clear from the email that I had written that it was all or nothing. And nobody wanted to know what nothing was. Mm. Right. Because I had clearly articulated all of the work that I had been doing and you could see that, oh, if it's nothing, who's, we don't have enough people to do everything that she was just doing, so we better go ahead and like take care of this. And I'm not saying that that's always gonna work out, but if it hadn't worked out, I would have known myself enough to like start the exit clock and start looking for a place that was actually gonna honor and respect what I was bringing to the table. And so, yeah, I just, I wanna, I want people to own that for themselves. Like, a bunch of you in this room are doing a lot of work that is outside 
of you know the, the black and white of your job description, like write that down, take stock of it, like put that on your resume, in your credentials, in your like you know elevator pitch for yourself. Like I'm great because, talk about that. <laughs> I love that, all of that, all of that, and then some. We could, I could literally talk about this for hours um, and be up here, but I want to hear from you all. We want to hear from you all. So, are there any questions in the audience? from our hop on. Hi, my name is Ann Crewall, and I'll be reading questions from the virtual app, uh, Hopin. Um, one question that was liked by other people was by Linda Holyoke um, that said, what can I review in the 990 to understand if a salary is fair relative to an institution's budget, and how important is this relative to market value? That's all the analysis. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, I think the, the first thing to, to look at in a 990 uh, of, a, of an institution are when you're looking at pay, obviously, um, the executives who are being paid who are listed. It will list all the board members who you know, are listed at 40 hours, whatever, maybe they make a dollar but then it will list the key leaders of the institution. And to Nadezhda's point earlier, 990s are in the rear, a year in the rear. So at that point in time, that's what that individual or those individuals were making. So when you think about COLA, cost of living adjustments, and just merit increases, and then also what we don't take into consideration sometimes, which are not always notated, are bonuses. Um, so those are some of the things that I would start to look at. Um, if you are looking at financial stability of an institution, which is important, um, assets that are listed uh, in the 990, what their um, closing year's um, uh, budget was, where they ended the year in the black and the red, how far in the black, how far in the red. Um, anyone else want to add? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's all of those things. The, the challenge with the 990 is that it's going to focus on leadership. And I think the question also said relative to budget. Yeah. That's a hard thing to give an easy answer for because uh, a budget is going to be made up of a lot of components and different organizations and um, industries might have, you know, different budget expense relative to staff. So, you know, I know, like, for example, in my field, typically 70%, I think, for a community foundation of expenses are actually staff. Um, are actually compensation. So, you know, if you were looking at that, you could be like, okay, here are the top earners, here's the total budget, here's what's left, how many people are left, and I guess you could try to back your way into it. Um, yeah. But that would be super complicated. But I would also say that a lot of organizations um, post a sort of annual compensation collective. So if you can find any of those, if you go look at opening job, you know, positions right now, because now that more people are posting hiring ranges and salary ranges, that can be informative um, as well as a, as a comparison tool. Yeah, one other thing to think about uh, when you're talking about comparisons, though, is to really think about the market in which yeah. that organization sits, because That's the salary true. there is not going to be the same as right. you know, San Francisco. So like, really take account uh, of the cost of living in that particular area as well. Hi, I'm Adrienne Hodges. I'm a clarinetist with the U.S. Army Band Pershing's Own, and this has been amazing to hear you all speak. Um, I realize how lucky I am that when I was 26, I joined the Army, and the pay has always been completely transparent from day one, and I just haven't had to think about this um, in the way the civilian sector has, so I'm feeling that gratitude. Um, and in terms of equity within the military or military band, it really comes down to rank and when people are getting promoted and then the amount of work they're having to do to achieve that um, promotion. And so I think we've come a long way, but I know there's a feeling from a lot of folks that um, there's people who are able to get promoted uh, basically by existing, doing their job, showing up, and then other people who feel like they have to uh, just go above and beyond constantly to have that same opportunity to get to the next level. Now, um, 
it's gotten a lot better. I was just picked up for promotion um, relatively early in my career, and um, I think it's pretty good from a leadership perspective of them trying to be equitable. But what I'm running into, so I'm wondering on that, but also um, I feel among myself and people of color this pressure we put on ourselves of we don't want to risk not getting that promotion, so I feel like we're all overworking to ensure that when that promotion board comes that we're not going to be passed over and we don't want to just trust that if we're doing the same amount of work as our, our male, uh, white male peers that we're, you know, we're just, we don't want to risk it for our own careers. And I just wondered if you can speak, speak to that mindset. Yeah, that's real. Um, I mean, on a daily basis, people of color and, and also women are uh, constantly overworking ourselves. Um, we don't have the luxury of being mediocre, mm -hmm. like a lot of folks are. <laughs> so we're constantly overworking and um, you know, showing up 200% versus our counterpart who might be showing up 75%. So I, I can totally empathize uh, with that feeling. Um, I think that needs to change. I think there are a lot of barriers to uh, success for women and people of color, um, not just in our field, but just across the workforce in general. Um, and, and we can't change that on our own. Right. You know, we all need to work together to realize that it makes no sense for us to be killing ourselves for a job that would replace us tomorrow mm -hmm. if, we, if we, you know, so something traumatic happened. So my suggestion is to constantly be checking on your physical and your emotional health. Um, I know in, in several of the sessions we've talked about therapy is a good thing. Check in with a therapist if you need to, but also have conversations with your, uh, with your, um, your senior leaders and talk to them about what you are giving and why you're giving it and is it necessary? You know, is there another way that we can be working you know, on a daily basis? Um, it might be that there aren't enough staff members. It might be that We've created barriers to entry because of the pay. You know, there, there are a lot of things that go into all of these situations, and I think we just, we need to continue being transparent and having honest conversations across the board. I don't know if you guys want to add. Um, I, I want to add something, um, just in reverberation of what Kim said. I also want to say, um, I feel that women oftentimes feel like we have to stay. There's a session coming up called Please Don't Go. I don't even know what it's about, but like I was like, I feel like that's women who are often asked to stay into, asked to stay at positions and in jobs because, as Nadesh said, they don't want to figure out what the other is or the without. But then, to what end are you doing it? To what end are you continuing to put yourself through? toxic environments and situations, the emotional labor and all of that. And to Kim's point, yes, checking in on yourself, self-care, making sure that you are taking care of yourself first because you are, we are all replaceable. We are all replaceable. And you have to know when to say when. I full on left a job because I was like, nope, no more toxicity, thank you very much, goodbye. Mm -hmm. And it was tough, but it was so necessary. Mm -hmm. And so I want to encourage you, but also want to be realistic with, you only know who you are and what you can take, and don't get to the breaking point for what? You know, there's someone else and another institution, organization out there, and I say this for everyone who might be at the same juncture, there's a place out there who will respect uh, acknowledge, receive, and treat you the way that you deserve to be treated, and compensate you for what you are doing and what you, the value that you're bringing to the institution. Thank you. Another question from Hoppin was, what advice would you give to a newcomer immigrant BIPOC woman in arts and culture for whom getting a job is hard enough that the thought of being able to negotiate pay sounds too good to be true? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> go, go for it. I feel 
like I'm talking a lot, but. No, and you should. <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, um, the thought of negotiation shouldn't, shouldn't feel stupid. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah. Uh, no, you are worth, period, full stop. You deserve, period, full stop. And if you feel that you shouldn't negotiate, please know that your white counterpart, who is most definitely a male, is going to negotiate. And then sometimes, who is a woman, will also negotiate and get what they asked for. So you deserve, yeah. you deserve, you, you are all of those things you deserve. Yeah. yeah. And I'd also like to add that, um, going back to something that Tanisha said earlier, the, the entry salary to that organization is very important because everything that comes after that will be based on that salary. So if you take a position and you've shorted yourself in your negotiation, remember that when it comes time for a merit increase or something like that, that percentage is based upon your current salary. Even so if you raise 15, even if you raise $15 million. Right. Million dollars. right. <laughs> right. right. That, so yeah. just, just remember um, that it is, it's really important to showcase your worth and, and really be very firm mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. Right, you're right. Like that first move is your biggest move. That's why sometimes people have to go out to go up. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's like once you're in, it's, it's a different energy and things that should be worked on. But yeah, like, Take as big a leap as you can in that very first move because that will set you up for success going forward. The, the going out to going up, really quickly. In, in decades past, it was a thing where people stayed at their organizations for 40 years until they retired. The days of that are no longer. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, the days of that are no longer. The, t the amount of energy that I spend in executive searches explaining to uh, search committees about the reasons why people are moving from job to job, the, the unequitable pay, the, the you know, wanting more responsibility, mm -hmm. all of these things are the reasons why people are leaving jobs in order to move up in salary, in responsibility, maybe in title. It's not a bad thing. It's not mm -hmm. a bad thing. There are definitely more people willing to come into the organization. So if you need to move out to move up, it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and notate that on your resume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but always negotiate. I mean, you know, I offered a full-time role to um, a woman of color at my last job, and I thought it was a good pay. Um, and she countered. And, you know, when I thought about the idea, she had been consulting, you know, well, working part-time, not really consulting. When I thought about the idea of losing her, you know, I said, you know what, I'm going to pay what she asked. Right? And it was fine. You know, for her, it was probably a nerve wracking situation because I remember she emailed, she's like, Well, is this negotiable? And I said, Well, do you have a counter? You know, I, so I was in a weird way coaching her. <laughs> like, I was like, Well, yeah. do, are you, do you want a counter? You know, and then she countered, and uh, it was, it was a 20% difference. So it wasn't, it wasn't a small difference. But when I thought about the value and uh, the idea of losing her and having to replace her mm -hmm. with somebody else in this full-time role that I was creating really for her, it was worth paying the 20% mm -hmm. difference that she asked for, and she got it. So, so negotiate. Negotiate your salary. Um, I think we are... Actually, I don't think I see that we are almost <laughs> at time here. And I want to just have a few minutes for um, our wonderful panelists to just share some closing thoughts with our audience here and our virtual audience before we go. Ooh. Um, you know, so what I would say on a personal level is we were kind of trained not to do most of the stuff we've just been talking about, <laughs> <laughs> but also, the, the places that we sit are also hard, right? So in some ways, I'm like, pick your hard. Let's, let's maybe do the uncomfortable negotiation. Let's maybe ask for what I want and see how that goes. And maybe you'll get it. But like, you definitely won't get it if you never ask. Um, and then on the other side of that, and, and I can say this as somebody sitting in a leadership position, is now that I'm here, I know I can't fix everything, but I can fix some things. 
the people who work for me are not going to experience the things that happened to me as I came up in my career because I can make that choice to be different. And so I would say it's, it, it's both and. Like, take ownership of you, yourself, and your space. And like, when you have the opportunity, and you might have it now and not even realize it, like, you know, pay it forward to the next person because as we all continue to do that, that will actually be a shift in how the industry shows up. Um, negotiate your salary, you know, cover that. Um, but also think about the emotional labor uh, that is probably gonna be included in the role. Um, so that's sort of the find your, your people aspect of it. Um, and be your own advocate again and be your own cheerleader. So write down all of the good things that you're doing that are beyond your job description for your next salary negotiation. <laughs> um, and I would just say networking is vital uh, in your career. So meet the people that are sitting around you right here. Meet the other people that are out in the other sessions. Really create networks that are going to be very powerful as you continue in your career. And also seek out uh, you know, coaching. If you're looking to move into a new uh, organization, you're looking um, to interview for a new prospect, use a coach. You know, have somebody really coach you through the interview process, coach you through the negotiation process, coach you through your career uh, as you move forward. I'm not saying that because I'm a consultant. I'm saying that because I really <laughs> think it's important. <laughs> and also, to, to, to put a fine point on it, you are worth it. Mm -hmm. You are worth every bit of it. Wow. Thank you all so much. Um, I am so grateful to have shared this space with you, to get to know you in this way. Thank you for saying yes to joining me on this stage. Thank you to the Sphinx organization for having us here. Um, thank you to our session coordinators, Jake and Dasha, who kept us sane through this whole process. Um, and thank you all for being here in person. Uh, thank you all for being here virtually. I hope that you have an amazing rest of your um, convening time, and I look forward to seeing you all. And negotiate up. <laughs> negotiate up. Thank you. <laughs>